As part of our communication to clients, we do a quarterly update. Uh, it's typically live on site as we bring the developments forward. Uh, our buyers, owner occupiers and investors can get to see exactly where we are on site, exactly where we're going to be next quarter. So you've got a kind of a roll in picture of exactly where your investment sits or your home is uh, when it's due to be delivered. Smithfield's slightly different because uh, we're early doors and obviously uh, didn't need to be on site today, but I did think it was worth just giving you a bit of an input into where we are currently work-wise as uh, we're very busy in the background, pulling together all the detailed design and particularly the planning consent conditions. Uh, so planning is just the first part of the journey. Now we start working through the planning consent conditions, which will take us around six to eight months. We're due to be on site in October next year. So uh, I've sat down with John Jowett of PJ Planning, just to talk us through in a bit more detail what work's gotta be done between now and the point we get on site in September next year. I'm here now with John Jowett of PJ Planning. Uh, John and I have worked together for many, many years. Uh, private, independent consultant, but uh, you know, someone that we very much see as part of our team, uh, working through our planning consents um, and not only at, to get planning, but also work those consents through so we can get on site, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail today. Hi, John. Hi, Joe. So uh, tell me a bit about your role, what you do, your business. Okay, um, I've been a planner for 40 years now. I have worked for four local authorities in-house with two house builders, Crosby Homes and Bovis Homes, okay. and had my own consultancy for the last 20 years. Planning permission is achieved by uh, showing that a proposal accords with the policies of the development plan, yep. uh, subjects or material considerations. So really what we do is project manage the process of, from going from a site to the actual planning permission and through to development. Okay, great. So recent, Big result for us with Smithfield. Absolutely. Um, our largest consent to date. So well done and thank you. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a bit about the challenges around that specific um, consent, achieving that consent, obviously politically uh, and what the city wanted in that area. It was another level from a kind of traditional obtaining a sort of a standard consent for you know an apartment scheme in one of the many sort of areas of the city. Mm. So in the context of uh, Smithfield, uh, Birmingham is obviously growing uh, apace. Uh, the background of the Commonwealth Games uh, in particular, which was very much based in the Smithfield area. And one of the uh, key components of the city's policy for growth in the city centre is the connection between areas. In this case, the connection between the city centre itself and the wider areas of development within the inner ring road. Um, so uh, Smithfield, the old city market site, the council came forward with a master plan proposal in 2016, which explained how they wanted to see this area developed. Mm. And um, they have promoted the development through partners, Lend-Lease, uh, which has actually left a lot of people uh, in a bit of a limbo. Uh, in terms of how they take their sites forward. So we decided uh, with, uh, together to take the bull by the horns on this one and progress an application. The city needs development. Uh, and this site prior to uh, uh, development had been sitting in a semi-derelict state for a number of years. The city were initially not uh, um, too keen on bringing the site forward in isolation, despite the size of it, two large blocks of development. Um, um, but we pressed and explained that the position of the Smithfield Master Plan as approved by the council was not definitive on preventing development of this site in isolation with uh, uh, assistance from legal counsel. Uh, and uh, they accepted that uh, in the end. Uh, mm -hmm. The Master Plan showed a scheme for this area of approximately 250 units. Uh, with the help of the architects, uh, townscape analysis, heritage analysis, a whole range of specialisms, we looked at how that site could be maximised in terms of the amount of development to bring forward. And the initial proposals that we put to the council were, I think, in the region of 650 units, yeah. uh, with a large tower on the one corner. Because of the uh, 
city's position as regards the master plan, they would not engage with us in pre-application discussions, which is our normal approach, in order to bring in certainty and work with everyone, work with everyone as a team, including the uh, council. Um, so we had to develop the scheme through the application process itself. And to be fair, the council did engage well with us at that point. Yep. That actually meant that the location of the tower moved from one end of the site to another in order to meet their concerns. And we ended up increasing the number of units to over 700. Um, that uh, eventually went to a committee. There were some uh, issues at committee which resulted in a, a change in the uh, number of uh, uh, affordable units and the mix, but overall uh, 689 units, I think it is, is a, a very uh, um, successful scheme in terms of planning, uh, support from uh, officers and members to a large extent, oh. and I think it's going to help to crystallise and catalyse the wider City Council development. Right, so would you mind talking us through a few areas that may be um the layman may not appreciate uh, goes on in the background for planning. So I talk about uh, the wind tunnel and what we have to do around wind, for example. When clients come into the office and they see our models of the developments, they typically think that they're sort of for sales purposes. And then obviously we're, we're explaining to them that these are actually run through wind tunnels. And it surprises clients uh, to the depth of uh, information that's required. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you just give us sort of a brief stroke of kind of the you know the, the different type of reports that uh, you know we have to obtain to secure planning yeah I, mean, I remember a few years back a very august planning journal coming out with a headline on the front it was usually no pictures lots and lots of words and on the front it said is it me or is it all getting more complicated and that was 15 years ago right. it's got considerably more complicated since then birmingham was a city that didn't look for uh, large tall buildings for many years it's only in the last 10, 12 years, it's taken this approach like other major cities. And uh, in, in parallel with that, the requirements in terms of environment, sustainability, uh, biodiversity, heritage, and so on, have all increased in terms of what we have to provide. Well, look, we're required by uh, government guidance to maximise development on cities. The Council are required by government guidance to be positive in terms of promoting development that's in accordance with their development plan. Sure. So um, we, uh, th that's a duty on us, which obviously helps. What we do uh, as planning consultants is uh, to bring all the specialisms together to show why the development is appropriate and acceptable in terms of the council's policies. So obviously the drawings of a scheme or a model of a scheme are very important. We need to see what it looks like. It needs to be a, a good quality design. Design is another key issue at the moment. Sure. But there are all these other factors that need to be brought in. Uh, in Smithfield, you have several listed buildings around the site. The relationship of the development to those and their effect on those listed buildings and conservation areas in the wider area has to be assessed and shown to be acceptable. So we uh, have to show in terms of all of those relative policies and all of the uh, wide variety of issues that are there that we meet the criteria and that the council can support the case. And obviously the more that we do about that, it makes the job of the officers easier and I think gains trust that we have looked at all of the issues properly yeah. and that the uh, scheme deserves their support. Great. Okay. I'd like to ask your opinion of the current status of planning generally, nationally, because Birmingham, um, <laughs> well, our experience as a, as a house builder um, in Norfolk, for example, uh, similar to the, the sort of the process in Birmingham, obviously, but when I say process as in the general speed and, um, you know, sort of delays that you um, have to accept as a developer. Um, just to get an application through, I was talking to an architect yesterday, um, and I think the sort of the general rule of thumb of you know the X amount of weeks that an application is supposed to be looked at and, and, and responded to is kind of just ignored pretty much nowadays. From the, you know it's not expected to sort of be anywhere near that criteria, mm. and um, certainly from a fresh application of a reasonable size scheme, um, I think most developers would anticipate at least twelve months to be getting it to a committee. Yeah. Um, so that being outside all the kind of current uh, framework of, you know, what where cities should be, 
Um, combine that with the housing um, crisis, housing problem that we have. Um, you know, so what's the fundamental problem, and, and, and what's the? How do you think it could be changed for the better? Well, what we all want, um, particularly developers want, as soon as possible, I think, is certainty about the proposal, what's acceptable, what's required to get it approved. Uh, if there are issues, how can they be overcome? And finally, what's it going to cost in terms of contributions? Yeah. So what I always advise, as you know, is a pre-application process to try and understand those issues. And obviously, the more uh, information that we can provide on relevant points, not everything, then the better the response is going to be. Where that's not possible, such as on Smithfield, yeah. that means that has to be dealt with during the application process. The issue with uh, applications, as you say, applications are supposed to be dealt with generally within 13 weeks once the application's been registered. It sadly never happens, however good the pre-application process. And the reason for that is down sadly, to resources. Our local authorities since 2012 have had the uh, grant going to them cut by over 50%. Uh, and at the same time as th uh, that's happened, obviously that's had an impact on the number of staff. Staff have been leaving to go to the private sector and other, where, other places. Uh, in addition, you have a, a much, as we've discussed, a much greater range of uh, uh, information that they have to consider and work their way through. Not only them, but other bodies. So, for example, drainage, yeah. sustainable drainage, was never an issue until uh, after the uh, National Planning Policy Framework came out in 2012. Now it's a big issue, it has to go to an external body, and the um, user friendliness, shall we say, of that uh, external body is uh, more difficult to control, and there are less obligations on them to react within that time. So that has an impact on the manner and time in which officers consider the proposals and then feedback to us so we can react to any issues. Finally, of course, uh, even once you've got to committee, um, there is the issue of any uh, what's called a Section 106 agreement, which deals with planning obligations such as affordable housing and other contributions towards education, open space, highways, infrastructure, and so on. Whilst that is normally a, well, always agreed by the time you get to committee, so that committee can agree those items, it then is rarely dealt with by the local planning authority in terms of completing that agreement until after there's been an instruction following committee. Yeah. So that again takes time because you spent time negotiating those issues and then you have to prepare the agreement to everyone's satisfaction so that it works. Yeah. So under-resourced, a lot more information requirements, yeah. uh, requirements on third parties, slowing the whole process down. Yeah. Uh, leads us to sort of where we are now and yeah. so so how can it be changed is it, is it purely resources it's fundamentally resources you know um i don't see anything getting easier sadly yeah. you know clearly there are more and more obligations in terms of uh, um, building sustainability environmental concerns and so on and that's reasonable of yeah. course we all want to contribute towards that but the um uh key issue, if you are going to place more obligations on people, yeah. then you need to make sure there is the resource there to deal with those obligations. Sure. Okay. So anyone that's reserved at Smithfield, uh, lofts or works, um, they're obviously keen to know when we're going to be on site. And our programme currently is to be on site in September. Uh, we may well be uh, before that, um, but that will primarily be for demolishment of the existing buildings on, on, on the site and then moving forward then to uh, construction proper in that sort of fourth quarter of next year, 2024. So uh, for us, obviously, lots going on in the background. Uh, and although you can't see any action on site, there's plenty to do, John, from a planning perspective. So I alluded to it before, obviously, the, the first part of the planning consent is very challenging, as we know, um, but we've secured that now. So can you talk us through some of the work that we've got to do between now and construction start? So aside from sort of us building the teams, deciding on the build methodology and the contractors we're going to use, you know, purely from a kind of planning perspective, you know, we get a planning consent. There's a raft of conditions before we can even get on site. So it's just really explaining, you know, the workload between now and then, really. Yeah, uh, that's right. So planning permission obviously is a key step, but uh, the planning permission, when you receive it, it's subject to a list of conditions and they relate to the manner in which the development is to proceed. Uh, and relating again to 
the increased emphasis on design and ecology and sustainability in particular, that has increased to the, uh, the, the list of items that we have to deal with. So, for example, uh, there will be a series of conditions that need to be dealt with prior to development commencing at all, yeah. which are our key priority. There's a key list of conditions then that relate to specific uh, points in construction. So prior to uh, um, above bang, a ground construction, we'll need to agree materials and so on and so forth. And then there are conditions that need to be met prior to occupation. So obviously the key is to deal with these in order to make best use of the time so that we can get on site at the relevant point. Each of these applications the council is supposed to have eight weeks to deal with them. But yeah. again, sometimes uh, there are certain issues where there are resource points. So um, certainly there's a lot to do in the background and we need to get on with those as quickly as possible. Yeah. So we'll be obviously working through those planning consent, um, conditions alongside what we call detailed design. So a planning consent, uh, as John says, is a, is a big milestone within the overall journey, but it really gives you a blueprint of, you know, what you can build in that location, density, uh, size, shape of the building, um, and accommodation numbers. We have to take that from a kind of conceptual uh, consent into what we call detailed design, so we can come out the other end with uh, with a with an engineered plan that can be built. So we're really taking sort of that conceptual design from an architectural perspective into building uh, construction terms, and that does take some time. Thanks, John. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Joe. So I hope you found that useful uh, and a bit of an insight into where we are currently. Lots going on. Um, and then we'll be bringing you another update uh, shortly. And then hopefully when we're getting into site, obviously then we can get back to our usual kind of quarterly updates where you'll see activity and then progress on site from us getting into the ground to uh, delivering your Smithfield unit.